Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such an inspirational show for you this evening. Tammy Jo Schultz is here, and her story is just wonderful, as is her message and the way that she's inspired others with her own personal story. Uh, I'd like to begin by welcoming all of you and thanking you for sharing your Valentine's Day with us here at Social Flight as we celebrate our love of flying with this show and with Tammy Jo this evening. Uh, tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Avidyne and their IFD series of navigators, the IFD 550 that we have in the Bonanza and we are building into this Mustang that we are building behind me. Uh, I just absolutely love the Avidyne products. The Avidyne 550 includes synthetic vision on it. They keep adding new products and new software updates with, uh, with wonderful things. And so far, every time that there's been a new feature added to our IFD line of products, it's just been free with a new software upgrade. So I really celebrate a company that sticks with us in general aviation, that keeps improving their products and is open to just networking with everyone and everything else that works in our panel. So thanks so much to them for the IFD 550, the 540, the 440, and the rest of their product line. Uh, you can see all of that on avidine.com. In addition, be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. Uh, there is so much going on there, tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations. And in addition to that, our Fly to Win Challenge, where we are giving away a Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset. There's still time to enter. All you need to do is take, uh, get your phone, get the app, get out there and check in, even at your local airport. You'll be entered to win. And uh, if you manage to get into our leaderboard, the top 30 people checking in at different airports, then uh, you will have an extra chance to win that Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset. Uh, in addition to that, it is education season. And Social Flight has uh, tons of education out there. You can get your get wings credits. You can get aviation maintenance technician award credits, AMT credits. And if you are an AMP with an IA, with an inspection authorization, you can get your ed, uh, continuing education credits for your renewal on Social Flight. Just go to socialflight.com and click on the FAA credit section. It'll lead you through that. You can watch videos, get your certificates, and qualify for your renewal. Now, tonight's guest, I am so excited to have her with us tonight. Tammy Jo Schultz is a formal Navy aviator and a retired Southwest Airlines captain. During her Navy career, she persevered through many challenges to become one of the first female pilots of the amazing FA-18 Hornet. She re received worldwide acclaim in 2018 when she and her crew successfully landed a crippled Boeing 737 following an uncontained engine uh, failure and rapid depressurization that nearly rendered the aircraft unflyable. In 2020, she was inducted into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame, and her book, Nerves of Steel, I'm gonna show that again right now here uh, to all of you, is an absolutely wonderful book. I loved it as a read, and uh, it is definitely uh, something that inspires others to follow in their own, uh, follow their own dreams, I think, uh, in the face of adversity, which is so much of Tammy Joe's story. I am going to bring Tammy Jo online now to join us. Please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Tammy Jo Schultz. How are you this evening, Tammy Jo? Very good, Jeff. Happy Valentine's. Happy Valentine's Day to you, and thank you for taking time out of your Valentine's Day to join us here on the show. Sure. Um, I, I understand that uh, the Dean may be off flying, and therefore that's why we got lucky. <laughs> True. My date is offline, so <laughs> good night. <laughs> Excellent. Um, your your story, which not only is kind of chronicled all over the, the web with the the uh, um, the incident uh, with Southwest Airlines, but really in your book, I, I found so inspirational. It all starts with very uh, what I would characterize as very humble beginnings that led you to flying. You, you, did, you were not born into an aviation family to find your way here. Tell us a little bit about your path that, that got you into the cockpit. Sure, I grew up on a farm and ranch in Southern New Mexico, and I grew up underneath aviation, I like to say. 
as the jets from Holloman Air Force Base would anchor their dog fighting practice over our big hay barn. Later, I would find out in life that you need a visual reference point on the ground to do your, your dog fighting. And so our, our big barn was the last thing on the road there in Tularosa. And as I watched that, I was usually mucking out stalls or stock trailers of organic fertilizer, and it just looked like a lot of fun. I, I started reading books about pilots and, and airplanes and came across my first aviation hero, Nate Saint, in the book Jungle Pilot. And he had his, his start in the military for no money down, which was what I had. And I just kind of started seeing his path and thought I could see a, a faint footpath for myself from barnyard to cockpit. I love that. And, you know, there's so much talk about the cost of, of aviation, which obviously is very high. And yet there are so many stories out there like yours of not uh, of you know, not having uh, money and, and having this be your dream, but finding a way into that. Um, what, what are your thoughts on how that can, you know, how your experience uh, did uh, into the cockpit uh, coming from that worked out? Right. I think, I think there's a dozen ways to get into a cockpit. And fortunately today, there are so many scholarships and, and different avenues in, uh, Commercial airlines, all the major airlines have created their own path. Now you, you will have to, to pay for it, but they, I believe, have found, uh, help, helped in, in finding ways to finance that for you. And so I, I do think there's so many ways. For me, I, I was drawn to military aviation. I grew up in a family that was very patriotic. My dad had served during the Korean War. and I just thought it would be a great opportunity. I really hadn't any idea of how a woman could serve in the military. And so whenever I saw flying and put the two together, I thought this was definitely my cup of tea. I, I love that uh, one of the things that you talk about in the book is how you, you had like broken windows and things like that from the dog fighting and 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 how your father referred to that as the sound of freedom right i i look at as an adult you certainly see it differently than what i did as a junior high and high schooler but uh, we even had a sonic boom one night that um, spooked our cattle we had Brangus, which are a little feisty anyway. But uh, when we woke up the next morning, there was just an empty corral. Uh, it had spooked them and they had laid down a Thai post corral, uh, one side of it. And uh, dad didn't complain. He just said, go get your horses, follow the tracks. <laughs> and we found them all about a mile away. <laughs> but uh, I laugh now also in knowing that uh, truly, at 10,000 feet in doing dog fighting, we should not have been having sonic booms on our ranch. I think there was a little bit of uh, freelance flying going on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that there were uh, things about growing up on a farm and that work ethic uh, that led to, to helping you through your path? You know, I think first of all, it led to an ethic of work needs a workforce. So it's uh, growing up with a dad and brothers that treated me as an equal. They expected the same thing from me that they had uh, work-wise produced themselves. And so it was easy for me to look at something and just think, oh, I think I have the skill set for that. That that looks like fun. And it wasn't until I got out into the modern world uh, that I realized, oh, there are lines drawn out here. I didn't realize that. Uh, we always think our parents are the old, old fashioned, you know, uh, people in our lives. And then I got out into the world and realized I had a very forward thinking family. Yeah, I, I mean, in so many ways, if I understand it correctly, you're the first generation in your family to go to college as well. Yes, my younger brother did, uh, did also go about 12 years later. <laughs> so. 
but it was for uh, for a parent both of my parents that had high school educations my mom particularly who's still living today is one of the best read people i know and so both of them were very intent on making sure we had the tools that we needed uh, piano lessons was one of them that they felt like were very important and um, and then whenever we got closer to high school graduation just making sure that we were pointed in a direction my older brother is uh, phenomenal he didn't go to college but he uh, I have to say he's just one of the most brilliant people I know uh, in the diesel mechanic and machinery uh, machinist field. Wow, I admire that so much. I mean, you know, and, and especially in aviation, our our workforce is is, is, is lacking as we move, look forward in pilots, but especially in mechanics, so there's not a lot to talk about that. And so people that really understand um, how to work on, on machinery and understand technology and uh, is something that we need more of in the world. Agreed. <laughs> um, there's uh, uh, another thing when you you mentioned, of course, uh, you know, less piano lessons, etc. And, and another thing, your book really talks about values. And one of the things I've I've really enjoyed about that is, is that idea that yes, you you had there were certain certain things in different categories you had to do, and that included music. And you could change instruments, but you could not you could not do it. <laughs> right. No quitting. You could only change. Absolutely. So, take us through um, how you, uh, you the challenges that you faced as as getting trying to get into the military in order to to uh, uh, find aviation through the military. Well, it started when I went to my high school career day. Tularosa was a little too small to have their own career day, so we bust into the sophisticated town of Alamogordo, New Mexico. And when I arrived, I'd signed up for one class. I think, I don't know that we had the option for two. And I hustled on to the aviation class. The colonel in charge was shaking his head the wrong way when I approached and said, this is career day, not hobby day. You need to go find something girls can do. And I, I just took the closest empty seat, not out of defiance or courage. I, I just knew our buses were locked. I had nowhere else to go. But uh, in truth, you know, I took his advice. I found something girls could do. <laughs> wow. I mean, is it, I mean, take us through that, because that's an important progression, I think, with how you found yourself, how you pushed your way in, into uh, the uh, naval aviation. and that was not not an easy path. No, it was uh, mid 80s. And so uh, women hadn't been coming through in any big number. I didn't realize that when I got, uh, I, I first gave up because the, uh, the high school counselor agreed with the colonel and said, no, women don't fly in the military. And there wasn't Google or anything like that at that time. So two sources of grown-ups that seemed very sure of themselves. I, I moved on to pre-med. I thought I'd be a vet, uh, veterinarian, and and went on to college and studied pre-med. And then I split that with agribusiness and a little music. And my, I believe it was my senior year or very close to the end of college. I went with a friend to her brother's winging there in Vance. Uh, Air Force Base in Oklahoma, and there was a girl in the class. I could not believe it, and I sat there thinking, I'm going to go talk to her. I just, I'm sure she's a rocket scientist, and you know, I'm a, I'm a biology major, so I, I bet it's just something beyond what my mind can wrap around. But I'm still going to talk to her, and went up, chatted with her. She was a biology major, and I just thought, okay. I've been given opinions, not facts, and just got my ARCO book to study for the test and started studying. The Air Force, uh, they they drew the line. They were not going to take an application. Uh, they wouldn't allow me to even take the test. I tried three different times, thinking with somebody else behind the 
the um, counter, maybe they'd have a different idea, but they didn't. And I went on to the Army. The Army was polite. And when I finished my request, they said, no, you're not a fit for us. And then on to the Navy. I come from a very landlocked state, so the Navy wasn't my first choice, but I look at that now and I can't be more thankful for the no's that I had along the way because the Navy was, uh, it was ahead of its time as far as women were concerned. Women in the Navy were allowed to fly tactical aircraft and tactical missions before the combat exclusion policy was lifted. Nobody else allowed it. And wow. we just didn't serve in combat squadrons. So our squadron was, uh, we VAQ-34, we studied Chinese, Russian, French weapons and tactics and then simulated those against our own fleet from Top Guns, students, uh, other squadrons, single ships, entire carrier groups. And so uh, I would encourage you, if you feel like you've had some walls built up in front of you or doors uh, slammed in your face, it may be that it turns you a great direction. It certainly did me. Yeah, ab absolutely. Now, along the, the path, did you find, you know, people uh, like even when you when you went into OCS on kind of both sides of the coin, some that that were uh, very against your being there and, and put up roadblocks and others that kind of helped you through it? You know, I, I would have to say AOCS was as fair as could be. We uh, at that point in in the Navy, women had their head shaved like everybody else. So we we had no special treatment at all and uh, just did push-ups, had our head shaved. I felt like it was it was very fair. Everybody was pretty busy trying to keep on top of their own feet. So they didn't have a lot of time to be um, uh, judgmental about anybody else. And I went there prepared uh, physically. I, I can't say I knocked the academics out of the house at all. I'd never even spelt aerodynamics before I got there. So there was a lot of learning to be done by me. But I went there physically fit. And, and so other than my mom telling me don't send home any pictures until your hair grows out, it was fairly uneventful. <laughs> Um, do you remember the first time that you actually had a flight, that you actually f flew in an airplane, and the first time you ever had your hands on the controls? Sure. I had taken a couple of uh, show me flights there in New Mexico before I got to um, flight training. And the recruiter that I did come across, it took me three different Navy recruiters to find one that would process my test. But when I found one, he was phenomenal. And he would fly, I was in graduate school by that time, and he would fly from Albuquerque to Silver City, New Mexico, and pick me up in a T-34, and we'd go do aerobatics. Now, I won't say that I was in charge by any means. So it was, it was really my, probably my, my first flight in the T-34 with Captain Costin, my first on wing, that I had my hands on the controls, and then the second flight when he wasn't doing as much demoing that I, I think I, I not only had my hands on the controls, I think I scared him a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, that, all right, we, I, I do need to hear that, that story of, of the uh, flight where he demonstrated something that perhaps he shouldn't have, and then you decided to follow exactly in, in suit that teaches us a little bit, I think, about what we should do in front of students. Well, I, as I said, I arrived um, learning what an aileron was, and so we went out our first day, and he said, all right, you know, pay attention, I'm going to demo the departure and how to navigate the MOA, and then we'll go do some, some landing practice, touch and goes, and then we'll come back home field, and so he, he did the departure, I learned how to navigate via buildings, bushes, and beaches to stay within the MOA. And then he said, all right, um, let's head over to do some touch and goes. I've, I've still got the aircraft. Let's just go ahead and do a downwind entry. And I froze. I thought I had studied everything, but I had no idea what a downwind entry was. And 
it, then I realized, okay, he's demoing and I'm just taking good notes. And you know, we have our knee boards and I'm writing everything down, trying to keep my head up like I'm really visual, but I'm, I'm taking copious notes. And uh, he rolled the aircraft inverted, pulled down. And when he rolled upright, he was on altitude and heading for the downwind. And I thought, everybody talks like the break is some hot maneuver. This was pretty impressive. And uh, we did the touch and goes, went home, did the break. And, and uh, the next day he said, well, Bonnell, show me that you listened. And uh, so I did my departure and I navigated the MOA and checked the, the winds that the outlying field had, they were the same as yesterday, the day before. So I got to the point in the sky where he had been, or as close as I could figure, I rolled inverted and pulled. There was pounding on the canopy and screaming, not through the microphone, but over the engine. And when I rolled upright, I wasn't quite as squared away as he had been. And he got his mask on and said, what in the, what was that? And I, I said, that, uh, that was the, the downwind entry. And <laughs> he, he said, I, I'm going to have to be careful. I see what I do around you. But we know Marines don't scream. There was just very excited, uh, excited voices from the back. I'm doing exactly what I saw you do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh -huh. That's that's fantastic. So you flew a lot of different planes and um, and and have some really great experience in some of the differences of them, uh, going from the obviously the the trainers with the T thirty four Mentor C to the the A seven, which I think everyone I've ever talked about that's flown that plane raves about that plane, and then up to the F eighteen. Tell us a little bit about each of those planes. Well, and and one of them that I flew in training, I I say. Um, it certainly de deserves to stand up with the fleet aircraft, and that's the A-4 Skyhawk, because oh. it was designed as a fleet light attack and then drawn back for training uh, later on for advanced training. So that was certainly a one of the coolest jets I've flown. The A-7, I think, is um, it's kind of a face only a mother could love. You know, <laughs> it's not sexy by any means, but... <laughs> It's uh, the single engine gives it long legs. It's got um, it carried more uh, 20 mic mic than an F-18, and um, getting to bomb in it, which was something that I think only my skipper had done in test uh, weapons test before Pam and I went, and uh, so it was. Um, I don't know. It was just one tough, gnarly aircraft. I think it. I think I had it wrong. I think it's the A4 that everyone raves about. Anyone who's flown, it's your. It's the A4 that anyone who's flown oh, says, yes. "Oh my God, my favorite plane." Oh yes, it's so nimble. You strap that jet on rather than strap into it. Uh, it's just it's narrow enough that you turn sideways to get your cockpit down and then square your shoulders, and um, yeah, it just felt like. You you literally kind of strapped it on rather than strapping into it. That's that's amazing. And you had the 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 benefit of being one of the first women to ever fly the FA eighteen. What was it like transitioning into that? Right. Uh, it was uh, the jet was magical. Now, since women had not come through the F eighteen rag before, and Pam and I uh, went together. Uh, through the F-18 rag, and uh, the the attitudes were, you know, extreme. Uh, some were great. My on-wing, I couldn't have had a more consummate gentleman and aviator, uh, Mike Frischi. So, uh, you know, there was great, and then there was, um, there was leadership that was definitely not happy to see us, and and very overt about that. So, you know, everybody, leadership sets the tone. And so that, uh, unfortunately, set the tone in, in F-18s while we were going through. But Pam and I had kind of put up with a little bit of uh, unhappy attitudes that we were there in the A-7 rag as well. So uh, I, I feel like we had our, our feathers oiled and ready to let it roll off. 
move on flying a great jet. What what advice do you have for people that that come across those situations where you are you're in a situation you need to push through you want to push through it um, but there's clearly people against you. You know, at the end of the day, we're responsible for what we say, for what we do, not for what they say, not for what they do. And my skipper, right before I went to the F-18, she'd already moved on, Captain Rosemary Mariner. She was in the first class of women to fly in the Navy, which is the first class of women to fly in the military, because the Navy was the first to open up. And the WASPs, I know a lot of people assume that they were part of the military. They were phenomenal, but they were not a part of the military. They bought their own uniforms, paid for, and designed their own wings. If somebody had an accident and died, they collected money for the funeral. I mean, the military did not support them uh, in any way other than uh, use their skills in the cockpit. And it was... Uh, they did a f- fabulous job of setting down a foundation for the rest of us to follow. But getting back to Captain Mariner, she once when uh, there was uh, my F-18 training jacket disappeared out of the training department, which eventually they said, oh, we can't train you anymore. We can't find your jacket. Can you and, explain what a jacket is to those who not, may not be familiar? Oh, sure. The training jacket is just all your grade sheets and your lecture sheets and just showing where you are in the program. And I was so frustrated because I thought, oh, my goodness, when is this when is this little turf war going to end? And let's just get on with it. We're all wearing green bag flight suits. We want to fly. That's it. But she said, you know, Tammy Joe, it's not it's not really because you're a woman. It's because. It's their character flaw, not yours. Just move on. And if if it wasn't because you're a woman, then it because it'd be because of fill in the blank. You know, we've always in in history we've always found some reason to uh, act up if we want to. So uh, again, just realizing, do your best. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, try to keep that bridge of communication and camaraderie open but if it's not available move on there's uh life goes on and and um we are ultimately just responsible for what we say and do right absolutely um that's i mean it, it, it's it, it's so true and and obviously you fi- faced a lot of challenges uh like that when you were flying in the military uh you also as you mentioned in the beginning face the same ones that everyone did in, in, in some of the challenges of learning the aircraft. Tell me a little bit about carrier landings, which of course, uh, you know, is a, is a great point of pride with those that have done it and, and, and others that are in awe of that have never imagined doing it. Sure. And before we move on, I do want to point out that for every bad attitude that, that I happen to come across, there was a hundred great. And mm. Unfortunately, you know, we we get stopped sometimes by by the ones that are blocking the path. But I think man or woman, we all have obstacles in our path. I look at the obstacles my dad faced ranching, uh, my younger sister who had cerebral palsy faced. Uh, I mean, I can just you can draw from every walk of life and every side of the man woman fence and find obstacles. So just keeping in mind, I think. That is part of life, I think, especially if you're going to choose something that's challenging and competitive. (laughs) You're going to have to bring your best game. I mean, you got to expect it. Um, Carrier landings. I I have to laugh. Those were something, of course, uh, in in Navy jet aviation. That's one of the carrots of of getting to go jets. One of the things they don't tell you is um, you will go solo. Your first time and every time as a student. Now you've practiced many of them, but the first time you actually look at a ship, it's uh, kind of sneaking a peek while you're in formation overhead and realizing, okay. Uh, I think honestly, most of us thought, okay, there's been thousands of knuckleheads ahead of me, and if they could do it, I can do it. You know, it's just that group psychology that has has a positive spin on it. 
And um, it's one of the reasons they do that makes sense to me now, but they don't want you thinking about what your instructor is thinking about what you should be doing. They want you thinking about what you should be doing and keep that decision loop very tight. And, and truthfully, your attention to detail is your own safety net and you hit the numbers and you land. You know, it's exciting. I remember just thinking, I mean, you're just, you slam in at 600 feet per minute plus whatever pitch the deck might have. And, um, and then when you get shot off, um, your eyeballs don't cage for a minute. Anyway, getting shot off the Lexington, they didn't. The Lexington, the older carrier now a museum. I think everything I flew in the Navy is now in a museum. Um, it gave you everything it had from the very first punch. So it was not an accelerated cat shot. It was a cat shot. And uh, wow. so you really did have a little bit of a, uh, you know, you, you kept your eyes open, but they didn't really focus for a few moments. Wow, that must be an amazing experience, and and especially the idea that that first time that you're doing it alone and it's quite intentional, and and yeah. that's it seems like one of the things that I will say that I love about aviation is we have multiple opportunities. Whether you're doing your first solo, uh, whether you're doing your first IFR, your first IMC solo, whatever it is, we have these multiple levels of chances that you get to experience breaking through a barrier. And doing something that you that seems uh, so challenging, so difficult, you're wired, and then you pass this level. And uh, these are the things that seem to keep us alive in life, to keep having these challenges. And that seems to be probably one of the most epic ones in existence of being able to to land on a carrier. Well, it it was certainly something that we we looked forward to, and then when we strapped in to go, I, I think everybody thought. I hope this works out. And uh, my parents, the first time when I got back from the carrier, of course, we once they got a phone, I grew up without a telephone in our home and um, or a TV or anything like that. And and once they got a phone, I would call them and every day and tell them how things were going. And when I got back from the carrier, the first time they said, never again. You don't tell us when you're going. You tell us when you get back, but I don't even want to know. When you're going. <laughs> <laughs> what was the what was the aircraft that you were flying on your first uh, uh, carry landing? Uh, T two, T two Buckeye, and then in advanced we go back for uh, we we do it again in A fours, and then whenever I went back as an instructor, a sir grad in T twos, uh, that was one of my advanced quals was. Uh, teaching carry landings and I, that gave me a few extra before I went off to the fleet assignment even though women weren't assigned to ships at the time. Mm. Wow. Now an another thing which I think is very helpful for people to to understand is you had an incident with uh, that was very difficult to get, get out of when you were doing training um, in an aircraft that ended up being I think it caused by an imbalance. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's really helpful for people to understand because it could happen on, on even a GA aircraft. Right. In, in T2s, I went back to work for a great skipper, uh, Fred Grant, Commander Captain Fred Grant. And I enjoyed being a student in his squadron, so I really enjoyed uh, instructing for him. I was the the only female in my squadron had been at every squadron so far. And so my welcome was really evident, uh, whether it was there or not, uh, I, I knew how leadership felt. And so Fred certainly uh, made it a, a very welcoming place to be. About halfway through when I was getting my advanced quals, uh, we had a change of command and the world shifted. And so I wasn't allowed to continue in with my guns qual. Uh, he said he wouldn't have a, a girl teaching guns. So I went to teach out of control flight. Uh, again, not meant in a kind fashion. It was kind of the, uh, uh, it was done very kind of public shaming uh, method, but it was such great training and when we'd go up, we'd do about uh, go to about 28,000 feet. It's 
how to control flight is something that everybody was required to do before they did their solo so that if they departed the aircraft they'd be familiar with the steps and and also the feel of it rather than become disconcerted and freeze they would know okay this was a stall or this is a spin let it settle down make sure i put in the the inputs for the correct direction because we're not used to going just sideways in a flat spin so it takes a minute to figure out the lateral G of it. And um, so that's what I would do. Um, and about 28 to 30,000 feet, we'd start with a stall and burn down our tip tanks. The T2 has tip tank, uh, fuel tip tanks at the end of the wing. And normally we'd burn off that fuel doing stalls, pretty benign recoveries, you know, and then move on into the more dynamic departures of, uh, that would finally settle into a flat spin. And the very first stall in this particular flight, the aircraft, instead of just bobbing down with the, no, the nose bobbing down into a uh, losing lift and a stall, it, it just, it dipped and the aircraft whipped around and instead of a spin, which is a flat, about 90 knots, uh, like a maple leaf coming down, it went into a spiral, which gets faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And um, I took over the aircraft. Usually I wouldn't take it until about 18,000 feet, but we had pre-briefed. If there was anything unusual that I would take the controls or whenever I did, then instead of me calling out altitudes, he would call out altitudes. And as we got lower very quickly, um, why his his call outs went from 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15. and pretty soon there was just this little squeak at every altitude. And um I I remember we didn't have recovery technique in the T2 NATOPs. They only taught stall recoveries and spin recoveries. And so it was an experiment at a at a very fast time. But adrenaline is kind of interesting. It it doesn't bring any epiphany beyond what you already know, but it racks and stacks your memory in a way that you can you can think very very clearly and also very quickly. And it fits a lot of thought into a moment in time, uh, which we certainly experienced in flight 1380. But I remember just thinking, I'm getting married in a couple of weeks and I'm gonna look like a monster bride. And I, I shifted the stick back and forth and gave the rudders uh, another kick. And if we weren't in control at 5,000, we had to eject. So, uh, but approaching five, it wobbled and we were able to uh, pull out. And I remember just saying, don't touch anything because i thought if i say the word eject like don't eject then off we would go uh because it was a pretty wild ride um but yeah we found out later that the tip tank one had asymmetrically transferred so one was empty while one had all its fuel stuck in it and the the indicators were so old and the plexiglass so clouded that we couldn't see the ball was stuck and uh, we called TPS, um, a test pilot school, to just find out, okay, what's going on with this? And they said, oh, you can't spiral a T2 unless you're asymmetrically loaded. And so I got the procedures to get out of it <laughs> for the next time, should I have to do that. But. So ultimately, it was a valve problem that had you asymmetrically loaded. Right. So, wow. You've had, you know, your your share leading up to to flight 1380. I think you also ended up uh, having to do uh, an, an IFR approach in in a very heavy soup, only using what was it called, the little peanut gyro? Right, the peanut gyro and wet wet compass. Um, right, I had uh, seven hours in the aircraft itself when that happened, and had to get a a no gyro approach, start descent, stop descent, increase descent, wow. approaching glide slope, you know, um, definitely something that, um, I mean, we, we, we collect these experiences and I, 
I think that's part of, it's just kind of a mosaic of, of what makes up the whole aviator is some of the things that we wished we hadn't had to deal with. <laughs> no, but they help prepare us for the things that come. And <laughs> which, which brings us to obviously the thing that, that has your name uh, in, in so many people's minds. Tell us about 1380. Well, it, it was a normal day and uh, we were on our second leg, leaving LaGuardia for Dallas and then passing about 30, 32.6, I believe, is when we heard an explosion and felt like a, a Mack truck had T-boned us on the captain's side. Getting to know a little bit more about the fan blade off incident, uh, it certainly helps me understand some of the things we felt because um, for us inside, you know, you don't know everything that's happened. You only know what you can feel, see, and the indications you have. And the aircraft uh, just tucked over and did a snap roll to the left. And we, we caught it. We could see the engine instruments for just a moment. I mean, when the explosion happened, we could see the engine instruments flashing and rolling back, and then the snap and the dive, and we caught it, and, and both of us were very careful and gentle bringing it back around and balancing flight with our rudder for having lost the engine. And then the shuddering that you would think, okay, you know, something happens and then it subsides usually makes us feel a little more comfortable. You hit turbulence and then it subsides or something to that effect. And this didn't, it just crescendoed. And then there was a noise that wasn't just loud, it, it simply smothered everything. We couldn't hear each other. We couldn't hear our own voices, let alone each other. And the shuddering kept us from being able to focus our eyes on our instruments or our checklists for a little while. We slowly brought the nose up to uh, minimize that. And on the ground later, we compared notes and uh, we both had this ice pick pain in our ears and realized we weren't breathing so well either. And so just getting into action about, we did one at a time get our oxygen masks on just so there was somebody who had their hands on the, on the yoke completely. And even before we could communicate, we, we uh, used the sign language and tapped each other on the shoulder to get uh, attention. It was a pretty hard hit. I mean, like the, the uh, fire extinguisher came off the wall and all the, all the oxygen, you know, the um, jump seat oxygen masks were flying around. And so it was, it was a pretty hard hit. Um, what, what was the rapid depressurization like? Were you able to see? I mean, what happened at that moment? Right. We actually had a lot of smoke in the cockpit initially. I think that was just brought in from the explosion uh, through the AC system. And then that intensified a bit with the condensation that was formed. Um, whenever, the, whenever the fan blade had sheared, it actually helixed forward in the engine, engine compartment and caused a sonic boom. And that was what actually, you know, peeled back. It, it blew the rim of the uh, engine off, I think in just maybe two pieces. It, ATC said it was large enough they tracked it to the ground. Wow. And then the small pieces were the ones that really did the damage. They're the ones that, uh, the cowling peeled back a little bit like a banana peel and then the smaller pieces of debris, took out chunks of the wing and the um, tail fuselage. It severed hydraulic lines and fuel lines on that side. And one of the windows got hit by one of those big buckles that's underneath the, the, the engine that buckles the cowling on. And it was a hard enough hit that that made the window give way. And that's where our rapid depressurization came from. Wow. So you had to obviously improvise quite a bit in order to be able to manage the aircraft. Tell me about the process of figuring out what the plane can do at that point. Right. Well, 
I, I have to give such credit to my crew. Darren Elliser was my first officer that day. Amazing man under pressure. I, I have to say, uh, having a team it means a lot when you're when you're dealing with so so much and in a combination that's never been taught before, never been experienced. So uh, our flight attendant, Shanique Mallory, Rachel Fernheimer, Catherine Sandoval, again, went above and beyond in their duties. Uh, Darren and I, whenever we got our oxygen masks on and and knew that we were able to control the aircraft because it it had been out of control. And, and we got it back before it rolled over and we were able to get the shuttering to the point where we could uh, read our instruments, get a hold of a knob and uh, switch, um, you know, some switches that we needed. I, I secured the engine having smelt smoke and, um, you know, the fuel shut off and things like that. But um, Darren and I agreed on Philadelphia and headed that way, and I, I just thought about probably the way a lot of pilot commercial pilots think about the people in the back. I always put my mom or my my kids in the back and mentally, and and realizing as startling as it was for Darren and I, I'm I'm sure it was mind numbing for those in the back. So I made a quick PA. It it wasn't eloquent by any means. It ju I just said. This is your captain speaking. We're not going down. We're going into Philly, and then got back to flying with Darren. And we navigated our way over towards Philadelphia. The one of the things that I think was uh, one of our there was a number of things that were challenging, but just getting down into richer air, assuming we'd have the thrust from the good engine to use, and it would be useful. Um, but also trying to see what is our drag ratio, how many miles are we covering per thousand feet, you know, and um, we, I think we lost maybe close to 19, 20,000 feet in the first five minutes, which wow. isn't ordinary, it's more, it's definitely steeper than what we planned, but we had a lot of drag helping us uh, get down, and then whenever we, we got closer to Philadelphia, and they asked us to level off at 4,000 feet going across the city proper, which is what we'd have to do to get over to 27 left. We assumed that we could. We had been at idle with engine, and whenever we pulled the nose up to level off, the airspeed just continued to vacuum off. And there was a certain uh, controllability issue with too much thrust. Um, we we only had enough rudder authority, you know, for so much thrust from the good engine because of all the drag. When you have that much drag pulling you left and you add power on the right, then, you know, airplanes don't fly well sideways. So we were uh, trying to keep away from being on the backside of that, that lift-drag ratio. And realizing also I could see our wing that was chewed up a little bit. Darren could not. And I, I had been flying for quite some time just because it was it's protocol and procedure that the captain does the, the emergency landing. Darren had done a great job. Uh, he was the one that was initially flying. And when we got hit with that fan blade off explosion, we both grabbed it. And then we divided up duties. And he flew for a little while while I took care of PA and finding a, a runway and things like that. So I'd been flying it for a little while and could could tell I really did not want to move the wing any more than I had to. We needed all the lift we could have with the least amount of drag. So for a 737, 700, that's flaps five. And it also gave us an ability to keep our speed up, but be below tire blowing speeds when we, uh, speed when we landed. And, um, so there was there was a number of things that we did different that day, but having the training and the systems and the checklists that create a mental uh, a mental flow when you can't read a checklist or um, there's a lot of chatter that you're you're answering or or dealing with, and 
our checklist when it's an emergency checklist is a challenge response response and so um, sometimes you just have to get creative I know in the the final section of our approach um, there was enough talking that I just pointed to the flap inhibit switch and Darren flipped it so that's the one added item on a single engine um, before landing checklist so you know being creative and communicative and we both had ideas and gave them up for the other person's idea if it was better there's no pride uh, in that cockpit we uh, I asked for the closest suitable field because we were shuddering so much that I really couldn't figure it out. Darren had his map already scoped out in a way that he could read Philadelphia close by. So I gave up mine and we grabbed hold of his idea. Uh, I needed, I felt like flaps five. In fact, I'm sure that was our only option of making the field that day. Darren reminded me that Flaps 15 is our single engine setting, which is great when people will step up and say, remember, we practice 15, it's single engine. And then when I said, we just don't have it, we need five and moved on. What speed do you want? You know, um, I, I really can't say enough about how well the team worked and the, the flight attendants in the back. I have to take a moment and say they were dealing with a whole different world than what we were dealing with. And um, when they heard the PA that we were, we had a destination, they unbuckled, got on their feet, went down a very rough aisle, aisle that by procedure and protocol, they, they could have stayed buckled up. But they changed the ending of that day by acting compassionately and getting up and helping people. We had a, a young mom with a six month old traveling by herself. She could not wrestle the oxygen and the baby and all this. We had pe uh, passengers, Andrew Needham, Tim McGinty, Peggy Phillips, that got up and faced that same rough aisle and went towards a very dangerous open window to help people. Wow, it, it's amazing. and. It, it's also amazing how the impact, even that that one sentence that that you managed to get over the PA is the difference between we're not going down, we're going to Philadelphia, and what that means to everyone on board uh, as well as to you in the cockpit. You know, I I think we forget how powerful uh, communication is. It doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to be eloquent to be useful, and uh, when we when we give give people a little bit of uh, of information that definitely can trigger hope that it hope did not change our circumstances for the next 20 minutes but it did change us and how we acted so sometimes it's as simple as being very clear and communicative with mm -hmm. your crew and your and your passengers yeah and i think the other thing that's that that's so inspiring about the story is as you mentioned everyone on board played their role and whether that be yourself and 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 your co-pilot and your first officer and in, in landing the aircraft the flight attendant and crew in how they helped everyone and even the passengers the idea that even after you landed they went back in their seats they didn't people didn't panic people didn't do things that could have caused additional harm everyone really did the right thing Right, and I hats off to to them. They had been through a very uh, incredibly rough ride. But again, when you pull people into that loop of knowledge, then I think you deal with less panic. Um, you know, I know you've seen it when you're flying. If if you're flying with somebody, especially if it's a two person cockpit, if you're flying with somebody that has their own little cone of silence going over there. It's just not as efficient of a cockpit. Mm -hmm. And so just being open with, with what we're doing, where we're going, why, you know, those things, uh, very helpful. Wow. Well, uh, Tammy Joe, you've been very, uh, I, I think, humble about some of the challenges that you faced, especially uh, through the 
you know, through, through your life and, and working your way even to being able to be in the cockpit. Um, and and I'll, I'll show the uh, a book again at the end. What are some of the, the kind of takeaways or lessons that you have of, of persevering through all of that and being able to get the building blocks that make it possible not only for you to make your own dreams come true, but for you to get everyone on the ground that day? Well, I would, I would say none of us are built like a tower. We are, we need a foundation and people are part of our foundation. I think also your personal life will lay the foundation for your professional life. So it is important and it does carry through. Um, I, I would encourage anyone that, um, Amelia Earhart has this great quote. I'll have to back up a little bit. I'm sorry. And, and she says, adventure is worthwhile. And while it sounds a little, a little clipped, I think that spark of adventure is, is truly, especially as an aviator, that's part of what pulls you through those, those, um, you know, times of adversity. And, and it just has a winsome way of putting you back on your feet and realizing I'm better prepared for the challenges ahead. Yeah, and you know, another thing that occurs to me both about your story and, and so many other uh, just am amazing people that we've had as guests on the show, that one theme is that so many people hit walls in their life. They hit things that they, they believe they're going towards one goal and they, in a linear fashion, and they, they hit adversity time and time again that perhaps steers them in a direction that ultimately is is where their mission is or where where they're meant to be, um, and it seems like your journey has been very similar to that. Oh, I I don't know of anyone that's gotten to take a direct path to what they set their mind to, and um, thank goodness. I mean, who needs a sidewalk when you can climb a mountain? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Absolutely. Well, Tammy Joe, thank you so, so much. I'm going to show the uh, the book again and encourage uh, anyone uh, who ha has the opportunity, please go out and, and read the book, Nerves of Steel. I absolutely loved it. Um, a great, great life story of, of yours and, um, and, and shows a journey of a very special person. And thank you so much for joining us this evening here on Social Flight Live. Here on Social Flight Live. Well, thank you, Jeff. It was lovely spending some time with you. Absolutely. Have a wonderful evening. And thank you for taking time out of your evening, especially here on Valentine's Day, to join us here on Social Flight Live. We'll be off next week, off flying, but we'll be back on Tuesday, February 28th, with the wonderful Ramona Cox. And uh, we'll be spending time with her talking about adventure flying and her life story. And uh, there's a lot to get out of that. It really, it, it just makes you wanna get out there and do more and more adventures. So be sure to join us on Tuesday, February 28th at 8 p.m. as always here on Social Flight Live for Ramona Cox. And until next time, thank you so much for joining us. And I wish you all blue skies.